Okay, 17, which choice logically completes the text? And I've got the underline at the end. So this is an inferences question. Okay, I'm going to read the passage and I'm going to try and infer what's going on here. So the Little Ice Age was a period of regional cooling from 1300 to 1850 BC in the Northern Hemisphere. Some scientists argue that a comet fragment hitting Earth brought about the cooling. Others disagree, partly because there is so some scientists argue such and such. Others disagree, partly because there is no known crater from such an impact that dates to the beginning of the period. Okay, so this is a typical inference of you know, competing premises. Some argue that there was a comet, but there's no evidence. So we can't claim or conclude that it was a comet is usually how these work out. So let's just quick finish up the text and then we'll check for that in the answer. In 2015, a attempt led by such and such detected a 19 mile wild crater beneath a glacier in Antarctica. The scientists believe that an impact caused little change, claim this discovery supports their view. However, Kana's team hasn't yet been able to determine the age of the crater. Therefore, the team suggests that we can't conclude it was a comet. It can't be determined whether a comet fragment could make a crater that big. No, that doesn't seem to be the issue. It's whether the comet caused the Little Ice Age. It can't be concluded that the impact that made the crater was connected to the beginning of the Little Ice Age. That's it. That's going to be our answer, right? Some say a comet caused the ice age but others say maybe not the evidence wasn't conclusive so it can't be concluded that comet caused the ice age that's the logic b is going to be correct we'll quick check c and d the scientists who believe an impact caused the little ice age have made incorrect assumptions no, nobody said made or incorrect assumptions in the text scientists have ignored the possibility that something other than a comet fragment could have made i mean that seems reasonable we don't see that in the text but there's no way we conclude that. We're just talking about the comet. Where I think could have been other things studied. So we don't know that anybody ignored anything. That's not a correct or valid inference from the text. B is the answer. So this is a classic inference setup. Some suggest this, others say maybe not. Therefore, we can't conclude this that was originally suggested or claimed. B is the answer. So we've got a command of evidence, support weakens. We want to support in this case. So let's read what's going on. Such and such and his team have investigated two subspecies of the chipping sparrow that live in the same region in North America, but one subspecies migrates south for part of the year, and the other doesn't. The researchers found that due to slight differences in feather shape, the feathers of migratory chipping sparrows make a sound that during flight is lower pitched than that made by the feathers of non-migratory males. So what do we have? We've got one group that goes south and those that go south have a lower pitch. Okay. The researchers hypothesize that chipping sparrow females are attracted to the specific sound made by the males of their own subspecies. So that means the ones who do travel, they prefer the lower sounds, the females, but it kind of also means the females, the one that don't go away, prefer the higher pitch sound, right? Because it doesn't say they all prefer lower pitch. It says they prefer their own subspecies. And that over time, the female's preference will drive further genetic and anatomical divergence between the subspecies. So there's difference in pitch will drive further change in the subspecies. So what would support that, my guess, would be continued evolution toward different pitches right the more lower for the moving the migratory bird than the non-migratory so let's see if we can find that answer a the feathers located on the wings of the migratory chipping sparrows have a narrower shape than those no it's not about the shape that's irrelevant to the question chipping sparrows communicate different messages to each other depending on whether their feathers create high pitch no, I don't think we really know that. And that's, again, irrelevant to the question. We want to support the hypothesis that there'll be further genetic differences over time. That is because the females support one pitch and the others support the other, which would drive that difference, right? According to the information in the first part of this paragraph. Over several generations, the sound made by the feathers of non-migratory male chipping sparrows grows progressively lower pitched relative to the one made by the 
Migratory males. No, that's wrong. They're mixing the facts. That sounds good, except it's not the non-migratory that goes lower pitch. It's the migratory. This is mixed up. This is the opposite, I think. Check D. Over several generations, the sound made by the feathers of migratory male chipping sparrows grows progressively lower pitched. Yes, the migrating ones is lower pitched relative to the ones of the non-D is correct. That's not mixed up. That's the answer.